I'm Maria Porges, a professor in Cal at the California College of the Arts Fine Arts Program and Visual and Critical Studies Program. Welcome from wherever you are and on behalf of CCA and the Sculpture, Ceramics and Individualized Programs, thank you so much for joining us today, November 16th, 2022, for the BFA Thesis Conversations presented by these three talented seniors. The talks you'll see each of them give today are just one of the final projects these artists produce as they move towards the completion of their degree and their graduation. So thank you families, classmates, teachers, and friends for supporting them. And a thank you to Ingrid Wells and Anna Gadish Linares for all of your help with organizing. So before we go any further, I'd like to make our land acknowledgement. California College of the Arts campuses are lo located in Huichen and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Ramiatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you, our audience, are joining us virtually today. If you're in California and are unsure of whose land you are currently residing upon, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. All right. Today, we have students from the three departments I mentioned. Each of these three, Dariel Calderon, Kiran Schwebe, and Anke Larson Iskamp, will make a 10-minute presentation sharing some highlights of their work and life. Immediately following each student's presentation, there will be 10 minutes of questions, comments, and feedback from today's respondent, Victoria Wagner. Sadly, we don't have time for the audience to participate in person in this Q&A, but you can add comments and affirmations into the chat, and please do. These chats will also be recorded and will be available afterwards for each of the presenters, sort of like a virtual guest book. So please do leave a shout out or a comment. The whole event will last about an hour, and again, I've asked, been asked to remind you to please keep yourself muted or we will have a hard time hearing all the presentations. Now I'd like to quickly introduce our distinguished respondent, Victoria Wagner, who is an assistant professor here at CCA and is also the assistant chair of the first year core program. Victoria Wagner's work conceptually explores the overlapping dichotomies of environment, climate collapse, feminism, and the role of beauty. Through painting, sculpture, installation, and public work, she shines a light on visual spectacle using tonal vibration, materiality, rhythm, form, and color. Her studio is located at her home within the forests of Sonoma County. She currently has a solo show at Maybaum Gallery in San Francisco, and her work has also been exhibited at many other venues, including Southern Exposure, Headland Center for the Arts, Brewery Project in Los Angeles, and Dose Projects in Brooklyn, New York. Now it's time to begin with our first presentation. Dariel Calderon. Take it away, Dariel. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dariel. I'm a senior sculpture major, and this is my talk. Um, I'm not sure if I should read this or if I should just leave it up. So I will read. Um, I create sculptures that bring into question the importance of spirit in modernity. They are mixed media ceramic works which are reliant on a familiarity with Catholic and Christian narratives. I recontextualize religious narratives and images to acknowledge the necessity of spirit within my life and to form a contemporary mythology. I'm interested in religion as a mode of understanding because it allows me to navigate and question my existence. In religious, religious ideology, just as science, is a readily available system 
which offers the possibility of fulfillment through understanding. I consider religion and science most often now because of their apparent opposition, and my work explores the importance of unification of opposites. Alchemy is the historical crossover between religion and science. Importantly, alchemy is a philosophy of change. Regarding the unification of opposites, alchemy acts both as a foundation for modern science, but maintains the possibility of something which cannot be seen, something which cannot be explained, something unseen. I'm facilitating change, asking questions, and seeking answer, answers through my making process. My practice combines ceramics with religious symbolic imagery in order to create new artifacts. The chemistry of ceramics combined with this imagery in the form of vessels suggests containers for a contemporary spirit. So, <sighs> this is where I'm from, kind of. Um, these are two photos. Two of these three photos are from my youth. I grew up in New York, and I, th I think my first real introduction to art was just the attitude of living in a place like that, which is kind of fast-paced and almost inseparable from art. And I spent my time exploring abandoned places and taking photographs, and that's originally what I came into New into California College of the Arts for. So. In terms of influences, I. I look at people like Hieronymus Bosch and Leonore Carrington. I look at old, paint, old painters because I think there's something significant about their work. It seems to me like they're more so embedded in myth and a myth and a kind of, there's a kind of magic that exists in these works. And I look at contemporary sculptures like Lucas Tamaris and David Altmed for material usage pattern, texture, and I think the attitude of making is very much kind of by any means necessary, which I appreciate. Uh, these are two older works, just to contextualize kind of the frames I've been thinking in. And two of those frames are structures and vessels, both as things which hold kind of historical significance and speak to myth and allude to a past and to a present simultaneously. This is a work from last semester. I consider this to be an experiment. And I think this was kind of the start of me exploring how to make work personal. And I'm thinking about a need for embracing a kind of shadow and a kind of a kind of darkness in my work through talking about things which are personal to me, which are sensitive. This is another experiment based on a Gustav, Gustav Dorr illustration. And I was thinking about death as this sort of a mythological character. And again, like a personal feeling that I need to think about a kind of darkness in my work This is a mixed media ceramic work, also from last semester. Yeah. Thinking about balance, uh, thinking about how life and death are predicated on one another and the acceptance of that lends itself to the possibility of hope and change, but also a kind of weight. Uh, thinking about the problems that I have within my own life and thinking about a darkness within a life not only as a negative thing but this thing which allows me to see positive um, another work from last semester i think probably a personal favorite thinking about the mystery that a vessel implies, thinking about religious narratives, there's an allusion to the Garden of Eden here. Uh, I think simultaneously thinking about, my work later becomes about alchemy in this presentation. And I think in this work, I'm simultaneously thinking about religious narratives, but also starting to form the ideas that my later works turn into. 
because the snake that's represented here to me stands as a symbol of, you could say original sin, but also in alchemy, there's the symbol of the Ouroboros, which stands as the symbol of, of rebirth. And if, if this vessel or this work is about fears, to take the snake's head off sort of implies the ultimate in fears, like a ceaseless existence. Yeah. Some more detail shots. I think this work was also important to me because it it allowed me to discover a material voice which I'm comfortable with, which is mixed media ceramics. I think most of the things in this presentation lend themselves to that kind of materiality. Um, taking ceramics out of this world that is I think sort of limited at times, um, very strict and pouring resin and putting enamel paint and all these other disparate materials onto this thing. Uh, another work from last semester, thinking about religious icons, uh, the Virgin Mary in particular here and making an attempt to recontextualize mythological and religious icons for, for a time that is new and I think ever changing and more complex than ever. I think this work to me is starting to develop new mythological characters, new religious icons that maybe will lend themselves to Yeah, a new sort of mythology, a new sort of spirituality, a new sort of religion. And then the rest of these are just works in progress. And I'm leaning more towards ideas of alchemy now, um, but also maintaining sort of affinity I have for religious structures and religious icons. And this piece is about, it's called The Sun's Reckoning. I also, I also could have titled it A Sun's Reckoning, spelled S-O-N. And I was thinking about what happens in a life when you forget or overlook the significance of myth and religion and how that leads to a kind of exposure and what takes the place of the importance of these sorts of structures and like these individuals, Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. And when those things are forgotten, what happens? And connecting that to alchemy, AU is what gold is represented as on the periodic table. But then I also learned that AU stands for astronomical unit, which speaks to like, it speaks it's, it's a way of measuring the distance between the sun and the earth. And I, I really appreciated that, that small connection. Another work in progress titled A Church for Unwelcome Friends, which I consider to be related to the, the piece which was titled Well Wishes, Hold Me Here. This is ultimately gonna be a, a church-like structure where in the basement there's sort of an allusion to this alchemical laboratory and thinking of gold as thinking of gold as an alchemical symbol for a hope for change and a hope for the possibility of like transmuting the self. Then if this is a fear-based sculpture, there's an allusion here to this liquid, which is called aqua regis, which is the only acid that can dissolve gold. So if gold stands for all these positive things, then this acid would stand for a kind of dissolution of, dissolution of hope. Yeah. Excuse me, Duriel. Are we at 10? 
Your 10 minutes is up. So if you can go to your last couple slides, okay. that'd be great. Series of vessels. Thinking about the way the world is represented, represented in small tangible, tangible objects. Uh, thinking about symbols. This is how they're displayed as minerals, minerals being a way in which we like, understand the world at large. And then this piece called Emerald Truths, which is based on an alchemical text called the Emerald Tablet. And it outlines a, a, a spiritual way to interpret and engage in the world and making the sculpture, I'm ultimately gonna write on these and thinking of personal truths as honesty as change and the importance of honesty in developing new structures. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, can you stop your share so that you and Victoria can have a conversation? Thank you. Nice work, Daryl. Nicole, hi, can you see me? Hi, yes. great, nice work. Good to see you. I haven't, I don't think I've seen you since the first year. That's been a while. <laughs> yeah, um, congratulations. I am really excited to see how your work has evolved and how you've kind of, you've, you've dug into ceramics. It's, um, your attention to detail is amazing. I, um, I can see where you, when you showed the slide of your influences, the Leonora Carrington and the Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch, I absolutely saw them in the, um, in the Sun's Reckoning piece. I saw this way you were sort of like collapsing this world into a small room. Um, and yeah, I thought that was really interesting. That the alchemy thing, I you know, I think it's it's so obvious in your work that you're kind of dealing with this life, death, creator, destroyer, you know, um, like hope and change kind of vibe that I don't even know if you need to be that direct about alchemy and gold. It's already in there in your work. It's like I see that in the evolution of your pieces, this um, reliance on religious iconography suddenly moves toward more of a spiritual understanding that you're maturing into, which is really beautiful to watch in the process. This kind of developing of your own relationship to kind of like um, the process of aging and relationship to nature and um, yeah, I, I think creator destroyer is the, the feel I keep getting from it. You know, what it takes to sort of, to build through change. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah, to build through change. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, that's why I'm trying to think about my works as these things which are facilitating change. Yeah, and how do you, how do you embed change in, into art? And how do you explain that a work is made for the sake of changing, lending itself to the, the idea of change without explaining it to another person? Maybe art just does that in and of itself. I think you're right. I think it does. I'm curious um, if you know now what kind of change you wanna talk about. <laughs> is, that a, is that a question? Yeah. Uh, somebody else asked me that question recently I, and I didn't know how to answer um, I don't think there's a, a concrete change that I'm looking for I think I think I acknowledge myself as somebody who's imperfect just like the majority of us and um, changes I think change occurs throughout life. It's this perpetual thing which should be embraced and it's almost hard to communicate when it happens, if it happens, um, and how to measure change. 
Ceramics is such a great medium for that because you deal so directly with state change of the clay, you know, as the water content changes. Um, I, I think that, that it's, it's kind of a perfect medium for that because it goes from moist to dry, but then you can play with it to make it look more so. I, the, the works that I really respond to, um, I love Necessary Reminders and Sun's Reckoning. Also, this kind of mini vessel periodic table that you made is amazing. Um, and I think that it's kind of embedded in there, this change, because you're showing clay that almost looks like it's burnt out next to clay that looks really fresh and fertile. So I think you're already, you're already stating change by using those two opposites in the work. Your mark making is beautiful. Um, in what was the, I think it was well wishes, hold me here, all your physical like scratching into the clay and, and um, uh, tiny detail making on the surface is absolutely beautiful. I just want you to look at all the California clay people, you know, constantly. Like it reminded me of an artisan piece right away, you know, um, Robert Arneson from Davis, who did lots of, um, of self portraits and really was like active and engaged in social change. Someone talking? So um, are, are you, what's the direction you feel like you're most attracted to right now? The last slide that you showed was the emerald one. Uh, what's the direction I'm most interested? I, yeah, I think the last piece is sort of the most disconnected from everything else material, material wise. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to stick with ceramics and mixed media. I think there's something there that I enjoy and it does lend itself to this kind of change, which I appreciate. Uh, yeah, mixed media ceramics is the direction which I just want to continue in, uh, strive for more detail. I want to be able to spend more time with things. Yeah, <laughs> school gets in the way, doesn't it? <laughs> in some way. <laughs> it's exciting then that you might get to get to it. I The relationship um, also that I'm seeing is between the body and the vessel. You kind of going back and forth between elements of the body that you that you embed, and then you show more deliberately. Um, the emerald piece feels like it gets a little further away from that. Um, yeah, I think it's connected, like philosophically, to the other works, mm -hmm. not visually or materialized. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you, uh, I'm curious, not necessarily between the relationship of those two things, because it looks to me like the emerald piece is part of something that might be more complicated and bigger. Um, but I, <laughs> go ahead, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I'm thinking about structures in my work and I, I'm thinking about alchemy, but in making those bricks, I, I think they lend themselves to like this potential structure which could exist. I'm also trying to give myself things to like, like continue after I graduate. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. And and I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of just a physical object, a brick is really like a structure that you build from. And I can imagine it getting bigger, something built of bricks that then becomes more of a, a larger story. There's these beautiful alchemical drawings um, from the 1500s. I can't remember his name, but I'll send it to you. I still have your email. Um, and it is, um, it is an artist that did a lot of interpretation of tarot cards. And they talk about alchemy in terms of sourcing the power of the sun and the moon and all these energetic fields. Um, I think it, it might be really interesting for you in what you're dealing with. There is a, there's a center called IONS, it's Noetic Sciences 
in, um, it's the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and I think they are in Petaluma, and they have free conversations all the time, and what they talk about is energetic fields, anti-aging, using energetic fields, invisible forces, and basically alchemy, and I think you might love them. They have a, a talk that I'm going to on Friday that is um, invisible beings and alchemy. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Ingrid just shared that link. Oh, cool. And also, I, I kept thinking about The Power of Myth. Have you ever read that? The Joseph Campbell book? No, I haven't read those. No, I haven't read those. That one might be a fun one for you. Um, I'll write it in the chat. It's kind of old school, but um, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of hero's journey stuff that deals with, you know, alchemy and, and <laughs> thank you, Ingrid, <laughs> um, that you might reference and see how those old stories, you know, we are, are constant for us. And I think what you're doing is, has such a great heritage to build on, such a great legacy. But for you, I think importantly, as part of a, you know, the Gen Z generation, which is, is I think my son is the same age as you, and he, I swear he was born like a mythic, psychic sort of moving around in these worlds that we took forever to try to build in my generation. And it seems like you just straight understand it. And I think as, as much as you can empower yourself to read about it and yeah. go as far as you can into it and see what see what the past generations have built for you. You can literally like keep, keep stacking up those emerald tablets, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so far I've kind of just been working. It's, it's partly like a, a limitations thing time-wise. I've kind of just been thinking of something and responding immediately, but I do want to get, I, I want there to be like a research-based component to my work so that I am like in conversation with all of these things, all of this information, which is available to me and came before me. Yeah. Which I think needs to be revitalized. Okay. We have reached our, the end of our respondent period. Thank you. Oh, to can I give you one last, can, Maria, can I give Daria one last suggestion? Sure. I'll be real fast. Um, if you don't already, an Audible account where you can just listen to books constantly. Yeah not even like really studying they're just they just become part of your studio background noise and you just it's like good food all the time yeah, that's a good idea yeah. <laughs> it'll be the best 14.95 you spent a month <laughs> thank you thanks maria yeah thank you to both you. With you. and now um we're going to join our second talk and that will be with kieran schwebe Hi there. <laughs> Getting all set up here. I have to. Uh... Perfect. Okay. I am ready. Awesome. Thanks for being patient, everyone. <sighs> cool. Uh, so my name is Kieran Joseph Schwabe. I'm a sculptor, fabricator, and potter. Um, I am really interested in machines, from machines of war to machines that extract resources to support capitalistic greed. My work explores the fatalistic realities of industrialism. My kinetic sculptures are machines whose parts influence each other in a kind of degenerative system that eventually implodes 
as an expression of warning within the era of the Anthropocene. So these two are, I suppose, my primary influences right now. Francis Bacabia is a post-Dada, post-Italian futurist artist responding to World War II and the fascism involved with Italian futurism. And Chris Burden is a performance artist uh, historically, but his most recent series or his most 20, recent 25 years of work, he's exploring these like, I think of them as structures of power. They are just a simple pump that keeps tons of wood and steel off the ground and viewers walk under that. So here is some of my work from, from 2013 and 2015, Beat Down in Ivory Tower. And you can see me thinking about some of the same things. We're trying to think about these mechanical things like um, Francis Bacabia does um, and alchemy, funnily enough. Um, in 2012, I developed a love of pottery. And this led me to making these bottles and doing high fire reduction stuff. Um, and high fire reduction pottery and trying to focus on that methodology of making and putting this high fired pottery and high fire production and trying to bring that in my sculptural work. So I made this piece as of last year. And this piece has this like jolty way of moving, um, which is kind of, it's kind of about the fact that it's, it's trying its best. It's not quite able to do something practical, but it, it's trying its best at, at performing a, a task that is, you know, you don't really know what it is either. Um, so here are some detail shots. Um, you can you can see this glaze techniques coming back up here. All of these were thrown on the potter's wheel. It's paddled cube. It's cut out. It's it's all it's pottery. Uh, it just happens to be moving. Here on the end is a uh, antler of a deer, um, and it's to further illustrate this this battle between nature and man or uh, chaos and order which is just a theme that I continue to try to bring up in my work and yeah um, so at my time at CCA I fell in love with the 3D printer and and what you can do with it I love process oriented art where the final result is a result of the processes that made it and I find that a lot of the time, if, if I'm hiding my processes, I, need to I find a different way to get there where I don't have to hide my processes. So this idea of the whole aesthetic is driven by the fact that it's 3D printed and there's no way else, no other way to get this aesthetic other than 3D printing it with the, the droops and, and, the, way, and the, the lines. So here again, you see this glaze that keeps going back into my work. It's uh, a high fire reduction glaze that goes from this burnt orange to this glassy green with this uh, bread mold crystal growth in the middle. So these are actually crystals that are growing that create a matte surface. Um, with this and with the reproductive quality of 3D printing, I'm able to create duplicates and explore duality of objects and what comes of like the same file being printed twice and having different outcomes. Um, here you can see I'm really trying to push the extremes of, of how much droop you can really get. Um, anyway, here is kind of the outcome of that, an exploration and duality where I am, um, oh my God, anyway. Exploration and duality, once again, I'm creating two lanterns. 
um, so they can play off each other. My whole goal in a lot of my work over the past years have been trying to bring fine arts into a music festival environment. So it's trying to bring ceramics, because that's my medium, into an environment that is stage, right? It's, everything's trash. Everything is, it looks good from 10 feet away, but that's it. So it's bringing these, these completely, um, complete art pieces, I suppose, that are made out of ancient materials to this environment where they really shouldn't be. Um, so my whole goal with these lanterns is to engage the viewer from this far away, this far away and 150 feet back. So here there were bookends for this stage. I, I designed them and made them specifically for this stage along with designing stage. Um, and here it is in, in the middle of the dance floor, this nighttime shot, and you, and you can really see how they play with the rest of the aesthetics. Here's the daytime shot, and then they, they get to play and frame all these decor elements in the middle. Um, so my whole goal with this work is to engage the viewer at all distances, right? So here they are close. One second. Here they are really far away, and they're still engaging, and they're still, they're still there. Um, this piece right here was another attempt at the same thing. This is from 2016. These are lanterns, but they're plant lanterns. So they're engaging during the day. They're, they're blooming orchids and, and, and tropical epiphytes. But at night, and even now, they're just, they're gone. So, and here's me doing the same thing again, bring ceramics to the music festival environment. I want to create these objects of memory, like a, a permanent piece of, of, of fine art, I guess, something that's made out of more permanent material, ceramics in this context, as a way for people to engage with the experiential aspects of the music festival, but have a concrete thing to uh, take memories home with because it's easy to forget all these experiences that, that you come with. So given that work, I've really been trying to explore or really trying to put these like cherries on the cake uh, of architectural scenes. So through that, I started this business or a studio, Copper Rivet Studios. I love this picture. Um, Copper Rivet Studios, we're doing just that. We're trying to put the cherry on the cake of these architectural spaces. This is for an architecture firm that's set up and down the West Coast. And this is going to be a bronze cast for their lobby. This piece is, it's called entangled is what the client called it. But it, it's a, it's a, it's a bent aluminum tree. This is about 14 feet tall. Back here, you can see our studio space where we have been working and making all this stuff. Um, and this is about 14 feet tall and it fits in a planter box uh, on the bottom of the stairwell. So the goal of this piece was to activate an otherwise kind of dead modernist out exterior of a home. And, um, you know, obviously it's in progress, but it's going to get delivered next month and it's going to, it's really going to look good, I think. And this is the work that I want to carry forward like bringing my ceramics work and my my large scale, I guess, installation work into these music festival environments with these fine art elements. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate you. Thank you. Wow. Okay, can you? Let me stop. You could go all the way back to the beginning if you wanted. So if you wanted to show everybody those images, yeah, without the, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be useful for our discussion to be able to reference the images. But if, if you don't want to do that, Victoria, I'm, I'm totally up to that. If you don't think it would be useful, I'll just close it out. I have a few kind of general comments just to start, and then maybe we can reference um, individual images. I, it's been nice to see the evolution throughout your um, presentation and kind of starting from the mixed media expressions of Chris Burden, these objects of war, so beautiful. I saw his retro in LA and it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. Just mind blowing. Um, 
I, and I, I really liked, I really appreciated seeing your kinetic work, the work that just has more um, movement to it. But then it seemed like you were able to distill that and, and get the illusion of that from the 3D printer as well. Oh, I, I didn't actually, uh, I didn't really have that in mind that I was trying to capture movement necessarily, but they do have a lot. They are like, they're captured a moment in time, but I didn't think of them necessarily as kinetic, but that's an interesting take on them because they do have that, that moment in time frozen. And the melting, the melting, the melting. and the, you have all this, um, illusion of time in the variance of the, um, high fire glaze, you know, crystallizing and kind of all the state change going on there, which is pretty fascinating. Those, those pieces are gorgeous. The, um, the way that you've shown, which I've never seen it shown in the way that you talked about it. Um, yeah, this is just, it's a gorgeous stack right here. It's beautiful in the way that it references time for me. Um, the illusion of time and sort of the warping of time. But then you also talked about something that you, you skipped over pretty quick, quickly, which I, I thought was fantastic when you mentioned that using the same program more than one time, it yeah. shows this evolution, which I also thought that that was, it's like having three siblings, you know, you you basically have the same genetic makeup, but they all can, it, it's, a crapshoot, you know? Yeah, I mean, I found this really interesting because like this, the same file will print completely different ways under the exact same conditions just because I can't get the clay the exact same consistency or the temperature is different or the humidity is different. and All these things just play into it. Are you also, when you think about your um, festival works, are you also 3D printing those or are they mostly hand-built? So these are all 3D printed. Um, and th this was all 3D printed uh, and made modular so that I could go a little bit bigger. In the past, they've been, um, like these were molded and I had to make the molds by hand and this one's wheel thrown and that's all by hand. Um, I mean, the, the 3D printing was a fun one to play with. I, I kind of want to balance these two aspects of like a machine made and a handmade and have these different uh, elements come together, like the balance between chaos and order, you know, my hand can be so chaotic, but the machine is, is always so orderly or you can flip those. And it's just an interesting duality to have. And I've been it also makes like work easier because I can ask a machine to do it and it saves me time, but it, bring that into the modern fold and yeah, maybe make the life of a craftsman possible and economical in this life. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You got to think about that. I, you know, I, I feel a lot of um, industrial design mentality going into this and, and also, you know, com commercial, like that you could really sort of, interiors, you know, work interiors with the lighting, all kinds of things that you can pull in that I think make this, it, it gives it so much potential, you know, for your life after school that you could really grow on. And I think you should be really proud of the fact that you like jumped out and you found partners and you're doing this thing and your joy is so clear in these festival shots, you know, that you really want to create a life where you can be part of this um, scene. Yeah, that that is, I thank you for acknowledging that's very much my goal right now is to try to make this uh, serve me in a way that uh, is beneficial for my community, but also beneficial for myself and my artistic career. Um, and try to find a way where I can do the things that I want to do in this environment that has money and attention and, and, you know, it has drive in there, it has young people going. Yeah, having these experiences that they take home. And that's you too, you know, you're making these things and when they do show your hand in them, right? You're using the machine as a tool, but you can start messing with those a little bit to show a little hand build in there, right? And then you're there, you're in the space with the things that you've create, you've made to create atmosphere here. I think you have a winning 
you have a winning combination if you really push it it just yeah. means you have to go to so many music festivals isn't that a drag <laughs> it's a lot of work honestly <laughs> uh, but i'm i'm looking forward to it uh i'm gonna try to get a mobile living setup where i can uh kind of come to a music festival and and be there comfortably for two weeks and work and do everything and not suffer yeah 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 i think you're you're off on your way um do, are you gonna have access to a 3d printer uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, for my personal studio here, uh, we're going to focus on casting. I activated bronze casting for myself in this space recently. So we're going to focus on casting and slip casting and bronze casting. And that's going to be the route for right now. And then eventually I want to make my own 3D printer uh, so that I can change the scale and make things a little bit larger or kind of control how much volume I can print. Uh, can print. Um, yeah, and that's what I do. I make like everything I can make, I make. So uh, I, I think I can make a pretty cool printer. Congratulations. I think that's great. You really set yourself up for launch. Thank you. I, I hope so. It's scary, but I hope so. I, I could see you do even doing more interactive community social pieces like doing pit fires at the beach and, you know, salt fires and doing residencies where you can do that. I know a couple people that do salt fires. There's like very few people in the United States, but I would be happy to introduce you to them. I would really like that. That's that's those are scenes that I really want to break into and try to um, kind of merge communities. I feel like they're so my communities seem to be so striated and separated, but they share so many qualities and traits. And I, I'd like to bring people together a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I know someone doing it up at Mendocino College. Um, up on the coast, north coast. Is that the Mendocino Art Center? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've 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 seen some stuff from there. Yeah, that might be a really great community for you. Well, I'm excited for you. I I think that it's nice to know you have partners out in the out in the world. So you're building community already. So you're not out there by yourself, you know. And hopefully that brings in clients. If you're gonna take it on the road, you might wanna play a little with aluminum too, because it's light. Yeah, right? that's very <laughs> much true. I, m me and my partner who made this tree wanna start trying to propose a project like this, the different vineyards and businesses and, and houses, because it, it's really fun to watch, like it's an experience to watch it happen because everything's really yeah. quick. Uh, and that might be a place where everything starts from. Totally. Look for the open calls for public art as well. That yeah. might be the next thing to start thinking about. Just keep yourself working, you know, learn how to apply to things, get some, some help, use CCA services while you're here. You can ask someone to help you build your resume out and, and apply for things. Yeah. I, um, that's what I intend to do. I'm, I'm going to be in the Bay Area for the next few years and I want to just engage with uh, the services and I guess things that I can get from the CCA community while I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. As an alum, you can use the coaches, the LRC. So yeah, it's always there for you. Congratulations. I'm really excited for you. Yeah. Thank you. You've got loads and loads of comments in the chat too. Oh, I'll check it out. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> All uh, right. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Also, like Diana Chavez in career development could probably help you direct uh, direct you to the right place. Oh, that's actually a really good idea for uh, for the city installations, huh? For the city bids. Just to build out your application packet for public art. Oh, so we could we could have our pitch deck and she could help us make it really good to send out. That's a really good idea. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you, Kieran. That was really great. Um, and it was, by the way, an accident. And it's you know, it's gone from your presentation now, which is great. Um, and now for our final presentation of today's BFA thesis conversation, Anke Larson Weiskamp. Weiskamp, Weiskamp.
Thank you, Maria. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, um, hello everyone. My name is Anka Larson Icecamp. I'm an individualized major with a focus on textiles, sculpture, print, and papermaking. I wanted to start with this collage, uh, which functions as a self-portrait of fragments of my identity to give you a visual to look at while I tell you a bit more about myself. So I grew up in West Sonoma County uh, in a forested river town called Mono Rio, where I developed a deep love for and dedication to the earth. I started my college experience at Brandeis University studying uh, environmental studies, immersed in very heavy topics of climate change and resource exploitation without any tangible way to process that weight. I left school unsure how I could best serve the planet. And it wasn't until I took a class uh, at Laney College with Andrea Singer Thompson and Sharon Siskin entitled Eco Art Matters that I realized I needed to go to art school. I live now in South Berkeley and I'm working on creating a sustainable practice that grapples with my relationship to the environment and to participating in a capitalist society that reveres expediency, automation, disposability over care. I turned to analog techniques like paper making and mending, trying to find some understanding of how to hold together a world that feels like it's falling apart and use found natural and waste materials to create a diaristic expression of how I exist in this complicated world. Mm -hmm. I'm inspired by the biomes of my home, thinking about the feelings of magic and safety that held me in these landscapes. In my practice, I am striving to recapture that sense of connection to the external that I once felt so strongly. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge again, as Maria did, that both my homes, Monterey and Berkeley are unceded territories of indigenous tribes, Coast Miwok and Pomo people in West Sonoma County and Chichenyo Ohlone here in the East Bay. I am reckoning with the privilege it is to have this intimate relationship with the earth, realizing the history of genocide and colonization of indigenous that have provided me the opportunity. I also want to acknowledge the faculty at CCA that have shaped my experience, specifically the textile department, which has provided my indie self a home these past two years. Deborah Veloma, Josh Fott, Ann Wolf, Angela Hennessy have all altered the way I think about art and the way I think about life. This is Hennessy's work in an exhibition held at Soma Arts earlier this year, which was a tremendous display of material as witness. I'm inspired by her ability to change the energy of the room and create dialogue between pieces, shadows, and space. I created The Shell No Longer Serves Me, thinking about the symbolic potency of material and process and how to express my dissociation from the physical form that I inhabit. The piece is made of sil a silk scarf that was given to me. I covered it in flowers and fruits and spices and steamed it, printed it with synthetic dyes and washed it until it was falling apart. And then I brought it home to repair. I'm considering how a cloth can function as a surrogate for the self and become a record of its experience. The objects incorporated into the piece become a, um, acknowledge the fragility of both body and cloth and the precariousness of how they are held together. As I kept working on it, adding my hair and the nail that I pulled from my foot, staining it accidentally with blood, the more it became a self-portrait of the human shell that I am continually forgetting to protect. Tears of velvet dripping, cooling, forming mirrors is a handwoven cloth with an indigo dyed warp and a blue velvet weft cut from a skirt of mine. The white resists in the warp express feelings of isolation, translated from the vertical to the horizontal as if approaching a pool of self-reflection. I'm excited by the opportunity in weaving, as with other repetitive and tedious time intensive practices to process emotion through the act of making. I listed sadness as a material knowing this cloth became a repository for all that I was going through and things that I needed to let go of. Looking for connection to my physical surroundings, I started working with different plants to make paper. This piece entitled Homeward Bound is a culmination of my first experience with forged paper making, an endeavor that in a time of homesickness brought me back to the magics of the ecosystems of my home. It depicts a topographical map of West Sonoma County printed over a stitched sheet of willow, coast redwood and grass paper and is documented amidst leftover fiber. The stitches hold together hours of collecting, cooking, learning, patience, and pain in a single sheet. The map documents a path inwards towards remembering and relearning what I used to know and as a physical record of my endeavor to do so. This experience was also the catalyst for my current body of work, which was driven by this amazing paper-making potential of the Coast Redwood. So I'm looking at 
the Coast Redwood both as a material and as a symbol. I started collecting redwood branches from the Oakland campus to make paper, steaming and peeling the bark, cooking it, cleaning it, feeding it into a pulp. Dealing with what felt like a very precious resource, I started saving every byproduct at each stage of the paper making process. I was amazed by the variety of shades that I could find and was in love with the process of creating them, but was also considering how these sheets held the time that I put into them. The memories of smelling forest scented steam in the studio and soreness in my hands after hours of peeling and scraping. How does this paper hold the stories from the place it was harvested from and from the tree's lifetime? And how does working with it activate that history? Wondering about the tree's lifetime, I started researching how the coast redwood has existed in human history, as well as into its ecology. The more research I do into this tree, the more I see how ingrained it is into a history of colonization and industrialization in California. I created this collage using images found amidst my research to sit with the legacy and consider destruction and annihilation in combination with images of interconnection and growth. I've been thinking a lot about how redwood trees reproduce through basal regeneration, sending new trunks out of basal burls, and how when a tree is killed, it creates a break in the canopy that allows these new trunks to rise up. My installation, I have found a place of learning and a moment to understand is a result of my year spent with the Coast Redwood. I wanted to use every extension of material I produced when turning redwood branches to paper to create a single installation. The title considers in part what it means to spend a year working and reworking within material limits. This piece made of six yards of silk functions as the backdrop of the installation. The towering length simulates the expansiveness of the forest, translating the smallness felt when standing at the base of a trunk. The deep brown of the redwood dye disappears as it moves upward, commemorating the loss of unfathomably tall old growth trees. I took inspiration from the carvings insects had made on the branches I was peeling, mimicking their patterns in the printed iron, thinking about corrosion and decay and the role of industrialization in deforestation. I lined the bottom of the piece with redwood cones, thinking about the seed as a catalyst for change. The gold used to hold them together acknowledges the capacity for hope, coexistence, and for magic within an industrialized world. Wanting to find more ways to visualize hope, I took the paper I made and created this crystalline taproot, which will occupy the central focus of the installation. The 150 individually covered diamonds are stitched together with copper wire. The stitching felt important, meant to evoke thoughts about wounds and healing. I wanted especially for the piece to acknowledge how it was made, the labor involved in repair, and the hours that I spent caring for these fibers. The viewer sees the cut and folded edges of the paper, the inconsistent stitching, the shadows of twist tied wires holding the piece together. All of these elements felt vital to the work, hoping the viewer will recognize this object as a product of a human hand and have them consider as I'm considering the implications of its creation. I'm still working on my show. Currently I'm making a sculpture using the peeled branches in combination with steel that will surround the taproot and extend discussion around codependency between the manufactured and the natural. I'm hoping to stay true to this desire to incorporate all the waste that I made throughout this project. I've been holding on to scraps of wire and bits of glue and plastic and other discards that I will use alongside the outer bark paper to make a floor piece that will lay beneath the hanging sculptures as if these things are dripping off of them onto the floor. I want people to reckon with the act of making as much as the made objects in front of them. Again, it acknowledges that these sculptures are a product of labor and resources. My hope is to challenge people to look at the waste differently, to see it as intrinsic to the installation and consider what value it holds. Moving forward, feeling at the close of my year with Redwood, I am excited by the possibility of exploring new media and processes. This is a picture of my studio and it's currently neglected, messy state, uh, but where I have a loom, sewing, printing, and paper making set up, and a collection of found materials that have been patiently waiting for me to work with them again. In the coming year, I will be turning this into a productive workspace, starting a garden of dye plants, participating in the Bay Area art community, and learning to quilt from my grandmother. I also found out today that I was nominated for the Wingate Fellowship, so I'll be working on an application centered around forged paper making 
with the hopes of having my research published within the next year or so. I want to thank you all for joining me today. I invite you to join me at Soma Arts November 30th for the opening reception of this work and for the work of other graduating CCA students. I'll be leaving this box of redwood paper scraps there if you would like to take a piece of the installation home with you. I want to thank specifically my parents, Amanda Icecamp and Doug Larson, for their endless support in whatever direction I head. For my grandmother, Claire Icecamp, who gave me a place to live these past few years and who is a constant inspiration. Um, Jamie Knight for teaching me how to make paper. Thank you. And to the amazing, amazing friends that I have met while I'm here, I will forever be grateful. Thank you all so very much. Have a good rest of your night. Um, wow, your work is stunning, Anka. It's yeah. absolutely stunning. What a beautiful presentation and what an incredibly thoughtful presentation. I can feel from here uh, on Coast Miwok land in Occidental, which is where I am right now. Um, I can feel your presence through everything that you do and your engagement and it makes absolute sense to me that you were nominated for Wingate. Congratulations. Thank you very um, much. Um, first thing, before I forget to say it, I think you should apply to the Lucid Art Foundation residency okay. in Inverness. Yeah, I think it, it would be perfect for you to have more time to explore, to explore Miwok land, right? It's right out there um, on the coast. And it would give you more time to think about what a healer you are, what a healer that this work has made, made you into. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, that the sculptural piece with the redwood paper, I just can't, I can't get the image out of my head of all those diamonds sewn together and such a simple, gorgeous form, but so provocative. It brought me right to the place where I am thinking about what I owe this forest that I live in. Um, I also work with redwood, so I understand how, how much it talks to you all the time. All right, Maria had mentioned that I was excited for you yeah. to be here tonight because <laughs> we're working within similar material context as contexts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, is your studio going to be in Berkeley? It is, yes. Yeah. Keep yourself close to the land. That's all I can say. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's my hope with this Wingate Fellowship, if I can receive it, to be able to spend the next year kind of expanding the time that I can spend in forests and you know different biomes of Northern California. Yeah, and you always have your parents' home to return to. Yes, I do. That's great. Um, it will keep you tied to the land. I. I can't, uh, I can't imagine your work without that. Although I think that urban living probably needs your help. You know, your, your healing help and your healing voice. I, um, I'm very excited to see how your work changes in the next few years once you leave school. Thank you, so am I. Yeah, yeah. congratulations on your SoMart show. That's amazing. It, and it opens on the 30th? It opens on the 30th, and then it'll be up uh, December 1st through the 3rd, I believe. OK. Um, there are a few things that I saw in your work that I, um, I'm curious about how you see them growing. Um, the, the piece that was sewn with, um, with pine cones and gold and dyed, that, uh, the textile piece that hung down from the ceiling. There was something about that piece that was so evocative of living in a forest in that the light was on the tip of it and it gradually got darker down as it got closer to the ground. Was that your intention with that piece? Yeah, um, I was thinking about kind of how it would dissolve upward. So having like, it's dyed with redwood cones um, and the bark, the water that I used to cook the bark that I made the paper out of. Um, and I wanted it to kind of feel as if it were dissolving away, kind of 
ascending up into the canopy. It has that feeling of being in the forest. Just right, you have to look up to, to find the light. And in looking up, you know, what it does to the body is sort of reminds us that we are, have spiritual connection when we're forced to look up. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's a lot of stuff going on sort of with the body and with the peace. I think it's really beautiful. Um, and I do, I'm, I don't think you would be detached from nature in Berkeley at all. I, there's a lot to discover. And there's also a lot to learn in, in um, the Bay Area. I just heard about the disease that the redwood um, or that the oak trees have, I think, or the madrone up in Redwood Park in Oakland. I don't know. Which means though that those trees might be a wonderful subject to work with as well. Yeah. Yeah, madrone's also, it's a nasty wood. It'll, it'll mess your hands up <laughs> or gloves, but that would also be an incredible thing to, to play with in terms of dyes. I don't know if, you, have you already played with madrone? I haven't, no, but I'd be very curious too. Um, where are you with the work for your show? You said you showed some process shots. What's next for you? Um, so right now I'm working with all of the peeled branches that I had left over. Um, I'm drilling holes in the bases, the like ends of each stick and inserting steel rods. And then I'm gonna be welding those rods together to create this kind of cage of branch and steel that will go around the tap root. Is that installation work or do you imagine it having more of a closed form? It's gonna be have more of a closed form that I'll be able to bring over to Soma Arts. Okay, great. So I'm working on it over at CCA now. Have you done any social practice work? No, not, not really. I can imagine you, the way that you talk about mending and healing and repairing, um, I can imagine that might be something that you would enjoy. I think so. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about with this Wingate proposal, thinking of how I can kind of teach forage paper making and have kind of like a conversation with people and show them how to gather materials and kind of find some to kind of rekindle some connection. I think that that would be a really wonderful experience. Yeah. And just the act of stitching itself, True. bringing two disparate halves back together is such a beautiful gesture, metaphorically yeah. and physically, right? Just yeah. textile you know, language. There's so, I mean, to be interwoven and to be mended, like there's so much, the, the language of textiles, I feel like is such, is rich with such metaphor. Isn't it? It's the great unifier. I think. <laughs> and I, I also really enjoyed being able on the, um, the dyed redwood paper triangular piece, the one that, you know, the one, I don't know what it was titled with all the diamonds that were sewn together. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, to see the visible stitching on that also was this reminder of the handwork that went into it. It really slowed me down that piece. And ultimately, it seems like that's what you're trying to do, is slow us down a little. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's for with work that takes so long to make and work that I feel so slow in doing, I'm glad that that's the effect that it gives. Well, definitely for me, I haven't looked at the chat comments, but I can imagine the same thing. <laughs> I'm very interested to see how your <clears throat> how your processes kind of live and grow and breathe. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with one of our alum, Shushan, uh, no, uh, Tes, Tesfus Gita, I think. I'm, I'm totally getting that wrong, Deborah would know, who was an indie industrial and textiles um, student working a lot of memory in her work as well, but she's from Santa Rosa. I'll have to reach out. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to connect the two of you just to have conversations about weaving memory into things and, and the work of healing tradition, sort of like family legacy and, and, um, and sort of a modern tradition. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Oh, John Jenkins just added it to the chat. So it's there. Yes. Oh, thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> wow. Well, this was great. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, hang on. Thanks so much. All right. Basically, that's it. Thank you. Remember, this will be available as a YouTube recording soon, in a few days, <laughs> to get put together and uploaded. And this was completely inspiring. I want to thank the three of you and the staff and say good night to everybody. Congratulations, everyone. What an honor to be part of this. And thank you, Victoria. This was great. All right. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.